Welcome to New Westminster School District's podcast series, SD40 Talks. This is a pilot podcast series, and if you are hearing me, it means you are listening to the second podcast in our series, and I thank you so much for joining us. My name is Trish Payne, and I am your host for this series. I am also SD40's curriculum facilitator for mentorship. Someone somewhere dear along the way believed in me and entrusted me with building a mentorship program for SD40. And with incredible support behind me, and if you're listening, you know who you are, we have grown from 35 members to 100 members in three short years. We began with a very simple mission statement, which was to never let anyone feel alone in this work. I believe we have stayed true to this statement and have become a proud group of educators whom we fondly call the Mentorship Crew. We walk this journey of teaching as mentors and mentees so that we don't have to do this work alone but also to support each other through a profession that is so profoundly a discovery of self. Mentorship has proven that we are better together and that SD40 is where it's at. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is a pilot podcast series for teachers to draw on specific topics. It is my hope that teachers will have a wide selection of topics to choose from and listen to at their leisure. It is about conversations from teachers from within our own district, conversations with our very own stories and gems from our new Westminster family. So speaking of our very own, today I will be interviewing four of New Westminster's finest. We have Colleen Carrington, who is a grade 6-7 teacher at Queensborough Middle School, Darren Ng, who is a science teacher at New Westminster Secondary School, Stephanie Musgrove, who is a kindergarten teacher at Lord Kelvin Elementary, and Richard Wynne Garrick, who teaches at New Westminster Secondary. Each of these amazing humans is a mentor in SD40. Our topic for today's podcast will be on community building, and these four educators are without a doubt synonymous with this topic. So thank you all for joining me today. How is everyone doing? Good. Fantastic. Great. And well fed. Thanks to you, Patricia. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to jump right in. What does a classroom community mean to you? For me, a classroom community is a place where you belong, or any community for that matter is a place where you belong. Like the Cheers theme song. Everybody wants to know your name. Yes, very much like (laughs) Cheers. Yeah, and it's just a wonderful place where everybody wants to be. The kids can hardly wait to get to school because they feel like they're part of it. Yeah, a number of years ago, a principal asked me this question very similar to this, and this was my answer. I said, the classroom community is everyone who walks through the door, leaves with a greater skill set, and feeling better about Mm -hmm. themselves as a person. Mm -hmm. I think that really wraps up my definition of a classroom community. Mm -hmm. It's that safety. I think, too, uh, a classroom community, if we're doing it right, it, it equips kids to be comfortable with being slightly uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. We're, we're not, uh, while we're trying to uh, help them feel safe, not too safe. So they should walk in and leave going like, whoa, like what, what are we going to do tomorrow? Or what are we doing today? Uh, but not in fear, mm-hmm. with genuine excitement. I like that. It's that idea of being comfortably uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. We want our kids, right? right? Yeah, we want we want kids to be on that learning edge, but the only way that they can thrive is if they feel safe in the community in which they join every day. And that idea of them feeling authentically part of the community, right? We talk a lot about community. What does it look like? What does it sound like? But do they truly feel it? And I think something that uh, we need to do as well with this idea of what community is is it has to be a place to play. We all know that uh, we start learning as players. We play in the mud, we roll around, we have this innate curiosity. And I find that uh, what helps make my classroom happier and with the kids in my classroom happier is we play all the time. In an English class, we we read poetry and we don't do anything with it other than just celebrate and enjoy the poetry. And so I think that that's an important part of it for me is we just play. Mm -hmm. Having fun and uh, once the kids feel super comfortable and feel like they're they matter and that their contributions are valuable, then they're not afraid to take risks Mm -hmm. and try those new things that you're talking about. And uh, kids that you would think would be reluctant learners that have learning challenges are right up there front and center, just trying new things and knowing that um, their classmates will support them and they don't have to be afraid. So Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling when you can see that happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important part of community that if you feel safe enough to be vulnerable, and then you can take risks. And we don't take risks with people that we don't trust. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how they're going to respond or react to us. That uh, a lot of those kids who keep to themselves is not because they don't have anything to add. It's because they don't feel safe enough to add to that. So I do think that safety is a big part of a community. 
I agree. And you mentioned the word trust, and, and this will come up in um, up some upcoming questions here. But, you know, how do you feel safe if you don't trust the people that you're with? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We absolutely have. So that actually leads to the next question here. What are some strategies that you use to build your community? And we've got such a range. We've got, we've got primary, we've got kindergarten, all the way up to secondary. What does it look like for you? different corners of New Westminster. I'm, I'm sorry, I find this one funny that you mentioned the differences in levels because mm. I've been fortunate enough to teach uh, grade one all the way up to grade 12. And uh, I use the same strategies in my grade one class as I did in my grade 12 class. Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. It, in, in my academic classes and my non-academic classes, it really comes down to uh, how do I create this as I have very simple rules, very simple basic structures where I say that uh, dignity is the root of all of our interactions. And so we explore what dignity is, and we learn how to treat each other with dignity. Mm -hmm. Then I teach them how to listen. I say we listen to understand, not to interrupt. And then we actually argue, and I encourage argument. And I want the kids to argue with me. But again, the rule is that we argue to develop clarity, not to win. So Mm -hmm. we're not out there trying to win. We're just trying to develop clarity. And so that becomes a foundation. And so every time a child does something, whether they're a grade 12 student or not, it has to be from the foundation of dignity and respect for everybody in the room. And once they understand that, everything else just takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you look at K to 12, right, how, how does it differ, right? Like we, we all want our little five-year-olds to feel dignity and respect as we do grade 12s. And we talk often about, like we hear people talk about how we're trying to prepare kids for the real world but this is their world. This is real, and this is world right now, regardless of what age they are. And, you know, if we're talking about we're wanting to prepare them for adulthood, well, adults want dignity and respect as well. And um, I'm the, the same as you. Um, just I've had the opportunity to teach primary as well and use a lot of the same strategies and actually a lot of the same resources. And I'll say to the kids, you know, this looks like it's written for little kids, but wait till you hear the message. So um, I think one thing, um, I have a special ed and resource background as well. And so one thing I really focus on, uh, kids at middle school age and probably at any age are very self-focused. So I try and get them not only to recognize their own strengths. So I I teach through a a multiple intelligences lens. So they do a self-assessment and they discover their own strengths. And then they also learn to appreciate someone else's strengths so that other student might not fit into our typical sort of reading writing math framework they might not excel in those arenas but they could be a really gifted artist or athlete or musician and so they learn to uh, recognize and appreciate each other's strengths and it really helps them in designing their group work because you want people with different strengths contributing so that you have a better finished product and they learn that it's actually, they do all these exercises to learn that it's actually more beneficial to have people with different strengths in your group than to have everyone exactly the same. Mm-hmm. So they practice designing a video game. And what would it be like if every single person was just a coder and you didn't have any designers or any, you know, other players in the in the design process? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, that really makes a difference to helping them appreciate one another and respect one another. Just what you were saying all about the respect. And if that's the foundation of all of our interactions, it eliminates all other problems if we just keep coming back to that and working through it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. But how powerful coming from the teacher that you're sending the message that everyone has something different to contribute that is honorable and just as valid as someone else. And I mean, that's something that we, you know, I, I think we, I think kids figure that out, like little kids in a sandbox figure that out, that someone is really good at this, and so they need them, they need them for this, and, and, and then I don't know if it changes over time. I was just going to say, uh, what you just said is so, so true. You have to stress that each intelligence is equally important mm-hmm. and equally valid, mm-hmm. even though they might be different, because in the school system, they don't necessarily get that perception, mm-hmm. and when they learn that each is equally valid, and that some students are more intelligent than Miss Carrington. You know, so and so, he's <laughs> much more music smart than Miss Carrington. He can read music and he can play, you know, the the clarinet. And then the kids, like their eyes open, like, what do you mean one of the students is more intelligent than you are? Mm-hmm. And then it really helps them shift their thinking and learn to appreciate each other just so much more. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. changes the role of a teacher too. When you're suddenly the uh, one of the members of the class growing mm-hmm. and learning from them. They, mm-hmm. I find the students love when they teach me something. Mm-hmm. 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 
Well, I think another big part of, of building community, especially when we're talking about kids, this is their entrance to school, that we need to make these words um, uh, experiential. So the word respect, mm -hmm. that is just a word that hangs over yes. them. And to ask someone to be respectful when they don't know what that means, besides modeling that they need to experience it. And so mm -hmm. I do a lot in my classroom of, of practicing of being a community member. And one of the first thing to learn to practice is how to be a speaker and a listener. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us, we're great at being speakers, mm -hmm. but taking turns <laughs> and waiting till someone actually finishes speaking before we start, well, that's a skill that needs practice. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of practicing. And all the other thing we do is we don't practice with just one person. That If they're constantly choosing their partner, that changes um, the way they communicate and their ability to accept and discuss things with others. And so we change partners every day, sometimes multiple times in the day, so that they're able to build those skills in multiple um, environments. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie, what I like about what you just shared there is how specific it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly in, in the science classroom, because it's, it's quite unique, uh, because we're going to be doing learning activities where if, if we <laughs> don't have a common expectation of what is safe <laughs> practice, uh, yeah. it could be more than emotional damage. It could be, f you know, I've just dripped acid on my skin and that could hurt me right um so very quickly uh when i the first week when i meet the kids similarly you i have some very specific common values and expectations that uh, we all can agree upon and so in my class we call it the 18 pillars and uh, we talk about you know the romans built things to last right and well what was one architectural thing they did to build things to last was that beautiful coliseum had pillars to support the weight and the whole idea being that the pillars allow you to endure not just through good times but also through the challenging times that affects your community. Um, community, part of the reason why community can be good is because it allows you to collectively not just celebrate things but weather storms, right? And so um, I, earlier in my career I found a, a parenting book because I happened to be a new parent when I started my career. And I just essentially modified, um, it was, I think, called The 21 Rules of This House. And it was just like a parenting book about, you know, how to raise kids to share and to take turns. And uh, dad and mom have a role and you have a role, right? And so if you think about it, one, one fundamental community is family, mm. right? And so by extension, our classroom, these are our, well, I tell my kids that I go, I'm going to treat you with the same care and respect as my own kids, right? And, and they like that. Mm. And then... We model that, but then we very specifically go through 18 things that um, work very well in the science classroom, but I would suspect they're, they're very similar to the things that you guys are doing in your classroom. I'm sure too. they are. Yeah. But and the, the word I, family we use too. We're yeah. a classroom family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess the big takeaway here is specificity mm -hmm. of like, you were like, there's times to listen and there's times to talk, right? But you weren't just respect. Mm. You, were you were breaking it down. And I, I think that specificity is something I see that all of you guys do uh, in your own ways, which is awesome. But you're doing it, mm. and you're very cognizant of what you're doing. And it's interesting because I, I, there's a reason I don't use the word respect, because by the time they get to my grade 10, 11, <laughs> yeah. and 12 classes... <laughs> They've heard it. They, so and and, and, and sometimes it's used as a catchphrase. It's on the announcements. It's on the wall. So I, I use the word dignity for that particular reason. And then mm. I... And I talk about instead of, I, and I say the word argue because I'm teaching is an academic term. So I, I, I use the idea of an argument is a position. It's not a fight. And so uh, like, you, like you said uh, earlier, that we need to keep building on uh, concepts and modeling and demonstrating, modeling and demonstrating. And if we don't do that modeling and demonstrating, we don't get community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, if I can just jump in on the, reinfor the reinforcement piece, um, I taught in another district in the earlier part of my career, and um, I was uh, introduced to this program called the SHARP program, S-H-A-R-P, and it stands for Safe, Helpful, Accountable, Respectful, or Positive. And so the kids, we co-construct, um, I'm using it with permission from this other district, and um, so the kids will co-construct what it means to be respectful and what it means to be not respectful. They'll come up with all these ideas and share and present them. And then I give out these little sharp tickets all the time and catch the kids being good. Wow, I love the way you're being so accountable and working on 
you know, your assignment. Or I'll give the sharp tickets to the kids to give to each other. Mm -hmm. So so so-and-so will be like, oh, you're super helpful, way to be sharp. So we give them a little ticket and they put their name on it. And it goes in a, a big bucket. And at the end of the week, there's a little prize draw. And it's a tiny little prize, but they just love being caught being good. And we're just continually reinforcing all those positive behavior expectations that help to make it such a great place. And so the kids that are, um, you know, prone to misbehave, they look around and go, oh, hey, so-and-so just got a sharp card for being positive. Hmm, I want I want one. And then they kind of self-correct their behavior just because you're affirming all the kids around them. Like, oh, thank you for you know, being so accountable and doing your work. And so uh, that little program, I mean, it really... Um, it goes a long way to help building community, and and I empower the kids to give sharp cards to each other, and they just they just love it. And then they leave my class, and they're up in grade eight, and they come back through my exploratory to visit, and they're like, "Are you still doing the sharp program, Missy?" Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I'm like, "Sure, let's do, it. let's go. Right, if you win, you get the prize." So, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, no, it's just that, but it's that continual sort of reinforcement instead of just sort of talking about it, and then letting it drift off and hoping they remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but well, then but then I'm just going to say, like, over the course of the year in the beginning, I give away tons of sharp cards, and then they just taper off to nothing because eventually they internalize it. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, that's just another way of making it more explicit. Yeah. You've just reminded me of a question that a brand new teacher asked me once not long ago when they, because I was talking about how to establish the structures in a classroom. And they asked me, well, how long do you teach that? And I said... <laughs> My reaction was exactly yours. Forever. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Continuously, right? We yeah. never stop. And so, uh, it, but my, they were looking for, because I take about a week at the beginning of the course where I don't teach English and I don't teach social studies, where I'm teaching you know, dignity, respect, compassion, love, mm-hmm. the foundation of all of our relationships. And, and uh, the teacher said, well, what about the choruses? And I said, well, if you do the work, you do this properly at, oh, yeah. at the beginning, yeah. the work gets done quicker, mm-hmm. much more quickly, mm-hmm. much more effectively. Mm-hmm. And Richard, one thing I'm very glad to hear you saying is like you uh, get the kids to do very academically rigorous stuff, but you are starting things with what's most important, right? Well, I find often I'll, I'll sometimes meet teachers and they're like, but we got to get through the content. We got to do stuff. I'm like, but if they're tearing each other apart, mm-hmm. there's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so it, it's very encouraging to hear uh, that you make that a priority. That's such a good example too, right? Of what Richard, what you were speaking to earlier is how, regardless of what grade, there are some fundamentals that are the same, regardless. And that that forever word, you do it forever. You don't ever. It's not like you do it until you feel that you don't have to do it anymore. You <laughs> are constantly reinforcing it. And then, and where do you start? Right. We want our students to feel honored and accepted where they don't they don't have to hide parts of themselves uh, we want them to have a safe community but then there are things you know using the word respect by the time they get to grade 12 yeah. how many times have they heard the word respect right mm-hmm. but then they get to kindergarten they don't even know what that is they don't even know how to spell respect no right? it's fascinating mm-hmm. so Colleen you're actually your your last comment leads into my next question so is there something that you do to nurture a strong community between students that is separate from you. I know one of the things that I I like to do um, is using kids' names and having students say each other's names. So, and Colleen, I know you've done this before as well. When we go to, you know, students might do some some AB partner talk and um, they're going to report out to the class and I often will put a prompt on the board that says, uh, so-and-so and and I feel, or so-and-so and and I think, but putting your partner's name in there to acknowledge the thinking of the other person, Mm -hmm. hearing your name sends such an electrical response to the body, right? And so having someone that you don't normally connect with, um, you know, on the playground, say your name and honor your ideas or to show that united front on what you were both thinking is so powerful. And to hear someone say, Colleen and I were thinking, Darren and I were thinking, you do. It's a very, very electrical response. Um, But again, it's just those small little details. And the research is there to show that the more connections students make inside the classroom, the less likely they are to bully on the playground. Mm. And on a senior classroom with the senior academic classes, what I often do is I have the students create the, um, the activities. And it, it's funny because I, we hear the new curriculum, we've been doing this for 25 years, where the students have been creating their own activities to demonstrate learning. And it 
ties into what you were saying earlier when you say the kids learn who has different strengths and different talents, mm -hmm. different intelligences. And we, after a while, a really short time, these kids start figuring out that having a bunch of great writers in a group doesn't ha doesn't work if you don't have a dreamer mm -hmm. or if you don't have a, a dancer. You need the you need the artist to enter to make something uh, amazing. And so I think the strategy I do is I give the kids opportunities to lead each other. I tell them this is where we're going, but I don't necessarily give them a map to get there. I say here are the strategies we're working on. Get us there. And sometimes they amaze me. Actually, often they amaze me. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the strategies that I use is trying to make things more visual, vis <laughs> visual, so that they are more tangible. That's the word, visual. That's the two <laughs> words together. Did you catch that? <laughs> it's a new word I've just created. So yeah, I've noted it. Copyrighted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I try to read books, picture books that are high interest books so they can really see what I'm talking about. And so we have been focusing on kindness books this year because if you are building a community for me the most important component is kindness and if you can be kind you're going to s you're going to create a, a safe space a place where kids feel free to take risks and so we read a book and then try to visualize what those components look like and then similar to uh, Colleen's handing out of the tickets for being sharp we uh, try to catch them in the act of kindness and take a photo nice. and so I've had kids this year saying, wait, stop, Mrs. Musgrove, we just caught someone being kind. Can you come take a picture of this? <laughs> oh, and yeah. so we take the picture. So then they are part of it. So the connection is they get their own, their self or their friends, what it looks like to be kind. Because even the word kindness, is what does it mean to be kind? That these, we throw these words out and hope they mean something to them. And so once they're in it, well, then they understand it. So we used a book that was beautiful illustrations and then try to recreate each of the examples of kindness by taking a photo so now it's not a page in the book it's a page in the book that we are writing so we'll so have tangible. our own book yeah mm. and they can say remember when so and so was kind when they pulled out those extra cushions so that a shorter student could reach and put theirs on mm -hmm. and so they attach their names and the actual situation to say that was kind mm -hmm. and they're idea. the context yeah right? mm -hmm. who doesn't love to see themselves in a book yes <laughs> they're creating the pathway to get to the end game as you want yeah. them to it's awesome. yeah yeah it's exactly. the same as uh, saying their name or having their picture up on the screen mm -hmm. kids light up when their face is on the screen or their work is shown and that pride um, can be used to help build community. That, that's awesome. And I can see the kids um, at the higher levels where they're able to create their own sways, like their own web yeah. pages. Mm -hmm. yeah. They can take the photo and upload it and, you know, we can have our our kindness sway and, and uh, yeah. they can populate it and give empower them. So that's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those real life examples make a big difference instead of tossing all these words out yeah. and hoping that it percolates and they really get know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Or try to say it louder. Maybe that'll work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they yeah, need yeah, to yeah. Really get it. I'm I've again touched. Sorry, I, I'm again touched by the uh, the connections between kindergarten and grade mm -hmm. twelve because mm -hmm. in the IB world we have a learner profile. There's certain skills, and one of the qualities that they want to develop in them, there are ten, is caring. And it's it. I find it. I'm laughing and smiling inside because we do exactly the same thing. We don't take the pictures, but they reflect on how have they demonstrated caring, how have they demonstrated knowledge, how have they demonstrated. And so the kids need to be able to pinpoint and say, on this date, I did this in this way. So uh, we're, we're not creating the book with it, but we're still creating the reflection exercise and finding themselves in these skills and qualities we're trying to teach. Mm. Well, then we could both say that they're both writing their stories. Yes. That's, I was going to say, there's one other thing that we kind of explicitly do, um, which you might actually do in kindergarten as well. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that book, uh, How Full Is Your Bucket? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's such a great picture book to illustrate kindness, like the power of your words either being powerfully good or powerfully bad, mm -hmm. and how you can either fill someone's bucket and make them feel great or empty someone's bucket and make them feel terrible. So we do a bunch of activities around that, and then I uh, purposely put them with, uh, partner them up, with someone who isn't their best friend, mm -hmm. and then they have to look for three wonderful things about that other person and write them a bucket filler and share it with the whole class and present it to the other person, and it goes up on a chart. And it's all those little things that the kids, uh, you know, because they're just so myopic, they're so mm -hmm. self-focused, mm -hmm. and then it really helps them to appreciate, like, 
I might not know you, but now I know that you ride a bike and you like photography. And then I have to find one more thing. I go and talk to your friends and find one more thing about you that I can compliment you on to fill your bucket. Mm -hmm. And so by making it explicit and trying to make it more concrete, they can see how they can be kind. Mm -hmm. And then they try and go and fill someone's bucket outside of our classroom, either in the school or at home, and uh, give it a shot and report back. That's powerful. I would imagine that the reflection on that would be powerful too. Like, how did you feel filling someone else's bucket? Mm-hmm. Right? Because mm-hmm. that's also what motivates kids too, is we, we want to do, we want people to feel good because of us. Yeah, that's right? what they reflect on. It, we, it feels better to give than to receive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you. So what do you hope a strong community looks like to your students? It's a big question, but when we're talking about hope, the biggest thing I hope is that My students, well, all of our students, will live a life and finish their educational journey never experiencing or participating in isolation. Social isolation hits every age and every kid. And if they understand community and they understand kindness, they have choices to make all the way through their lives on whether they want to be kind, to witness acts of unkindness and do something about that, or let it go, and if they really believe in community, they're not going to be those kids who witness things like that and do let it go. Mm-hmm. And um, the, a story that the greatest impactful moment of my entire educational journey was a story just like that. And when I started grade eight, because at that time high school was grade eight, actually mine was grade eight to grade ten, but I happened to move cities, so I moved from North Van at the end of grade seven, and of course didn't move. Early in the summer where I had a chance to meet anybody, I moved one week before school started. And on the first day of grade eight, I will never forget this, I'm out in this large, crowded outdoor area where everyone's waiting for the doors to open and see who's in their class. Everyone is meeting with their friends, their best friends from school, and of course I'm all by myself because I don't know anybody in the whole wide world. Anyway, a girl named Heather, and her name is important because we all need Heathers in our life. <laughs> Heather walks over and leaves her group of friends, her best friends, and stands with me and introduces herself and then waits with me until the bell rings wow. and the doors open. And I thought, why would you leave your friends to go stand with someone all by themselves? And then we ended up being in the same homeroom and chose to sit with me and not with someone that she knew. Mm-hmm. And I will never, ever forget Heather because... Mm-hmm. She made sure I didn't feel isolated, and she stepped out of her own comfort zone by leaving her best friends to just check on one other person, and it changed the scope of my whole junior high experience. That wow. It was the most important thing that ever happened to me. And so my hope is that my students will be Heathers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think probably one hope I have, I always tell the kids, is like I always point at the door and I go, I have a favorite rectangle in this room, and it's the door, right? And I go, uh, this is a two-way rectangle. So when our goal is every time you walk into the rectangle, something amazing is going to happen together, keyword together. I'm a part of that, but you guys are the bigger part of that. And then when you exit that rectangle, something has to have changed. Yourself is improved. You've done something kind for somebody. You've been called to task where perhaps you need to be more kind, but in a loving way. So speak the truth speak the truth but in kindness that's like one of our our pillars right and then i tell them that my goal is is that we're practicing how to be a small powerful community Mm -hmm. because especially with teens what really resonates with them is they're old enough to understand that not all is right with this world and they're wrestling with that because when they're younger which is awesome they they're kind of in the state where the ideals are attainable yeah. and then suddenly you go through this sort of existential crisis when you're about 16 where it's like whoa like the adults in my life can fail me mm. and that's heartbreaking mm-hmm. right and so we we use that as motivation to go but we can model here something that may be different from out there here you can actually choose mm-hmm. how you want it to go right mm-hmm. And then I usually share with them this quote from Margaret Mead. It's a classic quote that we've all heard that goes, and never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so the idea of the power of the small. So I ask them, I go, with our community, have you ever actually contemplated that you could change the world Mm -hmm. in big and 
quite possibly in small ways, but effective ways, like Heather. Yeah. That, that changed your world. Mm -hmm. It did. It was small, but it was huge, mm -hmm. right? And so it also changes our idea of, of accomplishment and what is the change we're making outside there, right? And um, I think more than, more than ever, kids need to have that hope. Mm -hmm. So, like, your question was, like, well, what do you hope for our community? Mm -hmm. That they leave hopeful, yeah. that they can repeat whatever good things happen here, maybe check out the things that didn't work so well, mm -hmm. and then do much better than, than we ever did, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, like, a community affecting a community, right? And they, that really, um, they're hungry for that. Mm -hmm. I find mm -hmm. teens are, because, like, you know, like, when we were growing up, um, uh, you know, there was... There was environmental challenges and things like that, but there there was far less cynicism than there is now, especially with teens, where they're like, "Well, my whole life I've heard about global climate change, and it's heavy, and you know, and, and I don't know what we can do about it." And so my response always is that, "Well, I know the solution is going to have to be with you guys somehow trying to figure it out together. And if we're in isolation, we're going to yeah. fail. Like we're yeah. we are doomed." And that cynicism will prevail, right? Yeah. And so community is in the hope business, for sure. Mm -hmm. I want my kids to to feel that I have the hope yeah. as well. Yeah. There's so much, like the Heather story, it's such a beautiful story. And I think if we all did an archaeological dig into our own early years <laughs> in school, we would find a Heather story somewhere. But I want I want my students to look at me as someone who has hope that we will get there. And there's so many unpredictable Heather stories out there, right? I think about even my own, you know, I, I actually switched schools. My parents pulled me out and put me into a different school because I was struggling at that school. Socially, I was struggling. And I remember, like, it was just, you know, I, I cried every day at school. I didn't want to go to school. And so then they put me in a different school. They thought, okay, well, this may, maybe this will be better. But prior to that, they introduced me to the principal, and the principal and my parents had a game plan, and the plan was that they were going to find me a critical friend who was going to be the person that was going to greet me. And so I remember when I showed up that very first day in my new school, I had spent two years straight crying every day, not wanting to go to school, and I show up at this new school feeling so secure because they, I believed the adults that they were going to find me someone that was going to make it okay for me that day. So when I show, I remember her, her name was Nicole. I show up and there she is and they were true to their word and there was Nicole. So she was the Heather of, 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 my, of my day. And uh, I just, the message that those adults sent mm. was that we've got you, mm. you're going to be okay. And I don't think those adults predicted that that was going to be such a profound moment for me that what I took away from that wasn't that I got a friend because we didn't become super close friends. But what I got from that was that my teachers wanted my day to be safe. That's kind of groovy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I never had a problem after that. I wanted to go to school. It was quite, it was, you know, I think about that story all the time when I bring my kids in on that. When I welcome those kids in on that first day of school, I think, who are the Nicoles? And who are the Trishes of the world? Or who are the Heathers and who are the Trishes, right? So if there was one impact you want your students to experience outside your classroom as a result of the tight community inside your classroom, what would it be? That's funny. I, I, I used the word groovy earlier, and <laughs> honestly, I'm not a hippie. <laughs> but, sure, uh, Richard, yeah, sure. <laughs> But uh, I often, I, I find myself uh, inspired a little bit by um, John Denver, who mm -hmm. spent a lot of his life going far out, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I often stop in my class when something strikes me as, as magical, or, and I, I say far out. And so I tell the students I want them to fill their day with as many far out moments as possible. Just stop with some wonder and curiosity and amazement. Mm -hmm. So really, if, if what I want is my community of students leaving my classroom with that tremendous sense of wonder and also the incredible drive to celebrate it, not be afraid to stop and be moved by the beauty around them and, and share that reaction. Because when I, I see it happening and I see these kids and I've got a number of students that I, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to keep in touch with over the years who are married with children and careers and they come back and they say, I had this far out moment and they still talk about this and, and and so it, it sticks with them, and they continue that um, message. I, it, you know, 
we've all heard the old expression which people use for teachers, if you can't do, teach. And I've uh, always hated that, but uh, I always turn it around on the students and I say, well, if you can't do, that usually means that you're just one person. Mm. And so mm. you teach and create a critical mass and then that moves forward and then you can make the changes you think are necessary and important. That's powerful. And so <laughs> that's why I think teaching is the most powerful way to create social change. And so I say to my kids, go through life with wonder and, and share it. And I think that if that's what they leave with, I'm happy if they forget everything else. That's, that's fabulous. I think one of the things I want my kids to take away is improve self-esteem. Like if you're part of a community that you feel important and that your contributions matter and that you have contributions to make like even if you have trouble reading and have trouble writing you you have great ideas like we just care about your ideas we can figure out how to get your ideas express your ideas some other way but if the kids if they leave with an improved sense of self and self-esteem then I think that's a long-term impact that um, our community can have on them and I think also because we do focus so much on um, recognizing the strengths in others with this whole multiple intelligences lens. You know, we talk about when you're older and you've got a job and, you know, you're part of a team, like you want to remember to look for the good in others. And there's going to be people on the team who might annoy you, but you, they've got some strength. You've got to find that strength and look for the good in others and appreciate them and try and fill their bucket. And you might you might be surprised at how you're able to create community in your new environment wherever you go. So I kind of like try and empower the kids to know that they they have the power to make these powerful changes wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully they feel better coming out of this safe place where they feel like they had a voice and they feel important mm -hmm. and they take that with them. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that when my students leave and they don't have me around to remind them on how to be kind and things like that, that the difference that they will possess is their ability to build community with everybody mm -hmm. that they won't they won't be choosing people who look just like them or sound just like them or like the same things as them that they'll be comfortable with things that are different and people that are different from them that like different things that wear different clothes that just that they're different that they are comfortable with differences that would be an amazing accomplishment i think uh the four things that kind of because I'm, I'm greedy. Like, I want, <laughs> I want the kids to get, to squeeze everything out of all of this, right? And the first one, I think, starts with uh, what you guys mentioned about safety, but specifically is you have learned in this community how we collectively have your back. And so now it's your turn to learn how to practice having the backs of others. And I suspect that's a large reason of why you guys chose to be teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Two... All these things you described about wonder, for example, and Heather, right, is courage. I want you to learn how to practice being brave despite what all of us being terrified out of our mind. So, like, be that first person who says hi when everyone else sticks to their friends. I think the reason why when Garrick, you and I, we, we have an affinity for each other is because wonder is actually at the top of my list, right? And so, sometimes I get a a bad rap for my class, and the, I always get asked, like, what are you blowing up today, Darren? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, minds. Nice. We're, we are blowing up minds today. And yes, it may involve some flame today, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but the idea of the reason why flames are so amazing is because they're primordial, right? So, like, when we see a flame, we're like, whoa! The, the most jaded adolescent, which is just a front in itself, it just falls away. And they're just like, wow! Like, how?! Mm -hmm. That's a, that wow and how is a pretty uh, winning combination in life, right? Mm -hmm. And then finding the humor in it when you get messy, when yes. it blows up in your face, when you, you were trying to be brave and you slipped on the banana peel, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And finding that humor in that, those four things, if they can carry that to whatever they do, they're going to bring a lot of joy and light mm -hmm. to wherever they go. That's so powerful. That last one too, right? That's that's part of us nurturing and building and convincing them that yeah. this is safe. Yeah. That we can laugh at it. Yeah. We can laugh at ourselves. We can laugh at what just happened. We can laugh amongst each other. That's what normalizes it, right? And that's what allows them to feel like, okay, no biggie. But no biggie about, you know, us making a mistake, mm -hmm. but big in its importance. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. these things are so vitally important, right? Mm -hmm. One of my heroes, Rachel Carson, She's a, a biologist and environmentalist, and she said, if a child is to keep 
alive, their inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship or she needs the companionship of at least one other adult mm -hmm. who can share it, rediscovering with them the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Like when I hear that quote, like I just, my heart flutters because like that, that's impact. And we're invited to walk alongside our kids to do that. We're entrusted with that job. I find it funny because I asked, I knew this was coming. So I asked my students today <laughs> to have a conversation about community. I said, so talk, and I didn't, uh, we didn't report out. I just told them I'm going to hang out and eavesdrop. And, and I just let them go. They talked for about 25 minutes. I, I just didn't need to do anything. They were talking and sharing stories, much like what we're doing. And they, they talked about people who made a difference and teachers who made a difference. And some of the um, overarching themes that I gleaned from the conversations were make it real. Don't just say it, live it, actually. Uh, and they said, and they listed a number of teachers. And again, I, I didn't listen to names and I told them not to use names. But they uh, listed a number of teachers who actually did live a sense of community, mm -hmm. give opportunities to check in. So the kids wanted to be able to have these moments to talk about it, to reflect on their community and, and actually put input in going, you know, we, this, this isn't working, let's try this. And so they actually quite like the idea when they're given an opportunity to create the structures within what they're working on, if it's not working or if it is working. They also talked a lot about practicing. So as we've all talked about, they talked about modeling. They wanted to be modeled. They want, us to, they want to see us doing it. Mm -hmm. But what made, you, what made me think of this was they all talked about teachers who laugh they feel in a classroom where teachers are smiling and laughing. And you know, I've, I've been teaching a long time, and I remember the first year, 32 years ago, the teacher, my colleague said to me, a young, excited teacher, don't laugh or smile for the first two weeks. Oh. We've all heard that. Yes, thing. we've heard that oh. before. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, of course, now I, I walk in the door, and the first thing I do is play some... Uh, you know, I, I, some, some heavy metal with the kids or <laughs> some Pink Floyd about we don't need no education. And I start mm -hmm. laughing and, and they really appreciate the idea of this laughter. And they, every single class talked about that today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just don't know which kids need the laughter in oh, that yeah. moment yeah. As, as the first impression that we can give our kids is so powerful. But we just don't know. We've got a class full of students and we just don't know what they need. But we know that laughter Mm -hmm. laughter helps mm -hmm. anybody right we need that too mm -hmm. we loved i mean when i think about my own childhood memories i think about all of the funny moments that we had that were like the teacher just paused everything and we just laughed like when i remember the hole puncher someone passing the hole puncher to the teacher and all the whole all the papers fell out like all the little it was like confetti all over the floor but it was being passed over a student's head and oh. i remember us <laughs> laughing so <laughs> and the teacher just laughed with us and it was just like this teacher paused everything just to enjoy that moment with us mm -hmm. and those are the moments that i remember i mean i remember so many things but those ones are the ones that are the core memories for me laughing with the teacher it made the teacher real and it also was just they sent a message that we, it didn't have to be business all the time and that we could enjoy each other in that capacity and that it was safe to do so mm -hmm. and, and on a funny note with that though although of course it's beyond the business it's just being human right pedagogically the life learning humor is actually great for memory mm -hmm. so i remember mm -hmm. in my uh in one of my teacher college classes where I was reading this book and they talk about like when people are laughing their tails off like okay so we don't need education if you're like ha! Yeah. like when Garrick is awesome right <laughs> it it's metacognitive mm -hmm. because you're mm -hmm. attaching An whatever emotion. you're learning with yeah. emotion yeah. Mm -hmm. which is powerful right yes. and memorable mm -hmm. yes so it's actually good teaching dude yes yeah. yeah and um if I can just jump in there in the beginning of the year, we brainstorm with the kids what your ideal classroom looks like, sounds like, and feels mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And laughter is a big part of that. And because the kids, like what you were talking about, Richard, you know, they, they're articulating their needs. And if we work to figure out how we can help meet their needs, it just creates this place that they love to be. And, and you, you kind of know that you've been successful when a few years later, like when I was walking... Uh, into 
and dub today into the high school, you know, kids from the middle school spotted me and started yelling, hi, you know, then you know that you've, you mm-hmm. know, because you, you have an authentic relationship with them where they, they know that you authentically like them and care for them and want the best for them. Yeah. And, you know, even those really challenging kids, I'll say, you know, you got to know, I really like you. I think you are amazing. I said, I don't always love your behavior, <laughs> but, but that's not you. That's just something you do. And so I think, you know, just trying to understand what their needs are and trying to help meet those needs and with the laughter and the joking around and the um, just allowing them to feel you're a safe place and you really do care about them, it just goes such a long way to creating that community that they'll remember and they'll talk about years down the road and that they'll actually say hi when they see you mm-hmm. <laughs> on the street instead of crossing the other side, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's that teacher. <laughs> their needs don't feel that different from our needs, do they? No. no. I remember the first time a student introduced me to their daughter. Wow. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, and they still called me Mr. Wynn Garrick. It was a beautiful oh. moment. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And that's exactly right. They came to see me. It was like... Yes. Beautiful. Mm. And that's, if you don't mind me segueing into one of your other questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where I was going next. Take it away, yeah, no, Carrington. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I was just going to say that I think when we hit, like when we hit the mark on all those things, you talk about what is the biggest impact that strong community has on student behavior and a well-being. well-being. Yeah. I think, you know, when you're able to build a strong community, those those kids with a really challenging behavior, their behaviors, they don't disappear but they lessen because they yeah. feel safe, they don't feel threatened, they know that you've got their back. And even when they have a bad day, you can work with them and support them and help them to be successful. So I think when you invest all the time in building a community, the investment really pays off because those really challenging kids that you know give you a run for your money, they, they know that you want them to do well and they you know, even though they've got their shackles up and all kinds of things, they, they still somehow come around. A story, one of my kids saw me at the musical not long ago, and he came up and gave me a hug and just thanked me. And I was like, oh, because that's, that's the power of community yes. and the power of communicating that we really care about these kids to them. That it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifelong impact that we leave, leave them with. I think further to to what you're saying too, which is what we're all doing as well. And Colleen, when I think about your multiple intelligences, all of that work that you do around it, it, you're helping kids feel like they too are part of a community that is a big picture, Mm -hmm. right? That no Mm -hmm. child has to hide a part of themselves. So the, the, the child that has been shy to say that they take violin lessons, which is actually a gift that they have that they can bring to this classroom, is now honored and celebrated and, and that alone, that feels so good. And when we have our kids feeling like these are all the little pieces that we're always tweaking and we're trying to put it together so that, you know, in addition to all of these great things that we have in place, we're also working on kids feeling damn good about themselves. And that helps build a community because they're much kinder to each other when they feel good about themselves. Right? Exactly. And so feeling like what you have is a value and something that is honored, even though it's different from someone else, feels really good. Mm-hmm. And that also helps to build that community and well-being. You know, counter to that, or not counter to that, in addition to that, though, you know, going back to that, the challenging kid that we've all had, Mm -hmm. the way you treat, quotation marks, the least of these, actually has a huge impact on the rest of the class. Because, say, one kid is, is out of line and is acting in a way that's tremendously disrespectful to the class or what have you, they were emotionally violent or whatnot, right? If we don't appropriately protect our kids, the the quieter ones who were playing violin may not want to share mm-hmm. violin if they know that the bullies are ruling the roost. Yep. Mm-hmm. So part of community too is acknowledging a community's need for justice, but then mm-hmm. not ending there, mm-hmm. extending grace, treating that the young person far better than perhaps is warranted. Mm-hmm. That that changes them because they're like, you know, I'm expecting this to be shut down and told to get out of the classroom. You're actually giving me a safe place to vent or to, you, you know, and make restitution and make peace with my fellow uh, classmates. And um, that, that, that affects the other 80% too. And then that, now I, I guarantee you after a few episodes of that, they, they feel far more inclined to feel safe and to share. 
because you know, they know you're looking out for them, but for everyone, mm -hmm. and not because you know Miss C or Mr. McGarry or Miss Musgrove is, is on a war path. Exactly the opposite. I care so much for you, mm -hmm. and for everyone else that I am going to call you out on that difficult behavior right now. And for us to progress, we need to resolve this. So that's a huge part of community too. Is is protecting the peace yeah, and that's encouraging that peace. Right? I'm so glad that you brought that up, Darren, because that's something that I have worked through this year with teachers as well is, you know, when there are challenging behaviors that need to be dealt with, sometimes it's public uh, and we do our very best to do yeah. it in a way that preserves a child's dignity. But when it's very apparent to students that there's something that needs to be dealt with, they are trusting us that we will deal with it. Oh, yeah. And... You know, when, when we let those things go, I think it creates, it feels like the floor is falling out from under them because who is going to take care of us, mm -hmm. right? It's that idea. So, you know, it's that fine balance between, you know, there's, we want to send the message that all of those behaviors are going to happen, but this is an unconditional place. Yeah. And despite that behavior, you're welcome here. You are welcome here. Yeah. But that behavior wasn't okay, and this is why it's not okay. Yep. And this is the impact on me, this is the impact on you, this is the imp impact on all of us. So kids also do look for us. I think, especially in those early years, we don't want to, you know, we're so worried about having to come down and, and students seeing us in this way. And but, but they do expect us to take care of the parts that need to be taken care of. And sometimes it's it's calling someone out in a way that's, you know, with dignity and respect, but they need us to do that too. And that's the message that they need to hear from us that we're taking care of everybody. And that means you who's not doing anything. I'm taking care of you by handling this right now. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the components of kindness is uh, your ability to protect others mm -hmm. and yes. also yes. to be able to say sorry yep. when you've blown it. And I think that a lot of the behaviors, the, the ch more challenging behaviors, decrease when kids uh, feel connected. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not going to say nasty things to someone that I like or that I have some kind of connection with. And so when we're building community, those behaviors lessen because they have a new affection for the people that are in them. They're, they all have value. And we're talking about... Um, the biggest impact, uh, for me, the, the biggest impact of a, of a strong community is noticing the increase in participation. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. when everyone is participating, yeah. yes. oh, you've done it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. You have yes. done something. It means that people are comfortable to take risks. It means that they believe that their opinions matter, that they have value. And so when participation is high, that is a mark of success. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is actually funny because at the high school we do something a little different than the elementary schools is when the class has changed, the students leave and go to another room. Yeah. And uh, if you're doing it right, I believe if you've built a sense of community, the kids don't necessarily leave quickly. And especially at the end of the day, yeah. they yeah. just don't leave. They hang out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. And, and then some of my most favorite moments were, was when students are doing the, they're staying, the, the room belongs to them, it's theirs. And uh, they just are there for a really long time. And every once in a while, they start talking about the behaviors. And it, it's in, when you talked about having the difficult students, I, I've, I'm often amazed at what the difficult students will say when they're safe, they're mm -hmm. in the right place, mm -hmm. and then all of their behaviors start to make sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think one of the benefits of dealing with these most difficult students is, yes, we need to be there to regulate the behavior. We need to be the, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And i had lockdowns and other things. And, I, and I've always found it interesting. I've got the big burly grade 12 boys immediately when something goes wrong, suddenly they're children again and they turn to us for that protection. So they, that doesn't really matter what age that is. They are the, they're always there for the protection. Mm -hmm. And if they feel safe, then it allows us to move through the, the bravado and the behaviors and actually get to the core of why they're doing what they're doing mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we can support them. Mm -hmm. you no, know, this weekend we had a birthday celebration for my mom and my nieces and nephews were there. And my, my daughter's nine, and one of my nieces is seven. And they get along really well. And But there's always something that comes up, right? And so it was, they both wanted to be the girl horse, is, is, what this <laughs> was, is what the problem was. But one of them said, well, no, you have to be a boy, too. You can't just have two girls. You have to have a boy. And you know, my daughter's like, well, why? Why do we have to have, we can have two girls. And and then that was enough to trigger, like, arms crossed and upset. <laughs> and and so then, and of course, my brother and I, we know our kids so well, and, and they both walk in and go their separate ways. We're like, okay, <laughs> what happened here? And, you know, I just, my brother's so good at how he handles everything with his, with his kids. And we sat there together 
listening to them and we want we realized that we just wanted to send the message that conflict is good like it's okay to have conflict and it's okay you know kids like especially you know k to eight they spend an entire school year together they're like siblings by the time april may comes along and and they can get into those bickering matches as well and it was important to my brother and i that our kids understood that it's okay to have conflict we have conflict and it affects us and we cross our arms sometimes because we do care so much about each other which is why it's why we're feeling it but what's the most important, which is I think the message that as teachers we have to make sure we send to our students, is the resolution piece that's yeah. actually more important. Yeah. It's okay yeah. to see an argument. It's okay to see maybe perhaps even a fight. But what our kids absolutely need to see, what's not okay, is if they don't see the resolution. Mm-hmm. And so as teachers, we have to be aware of that too, that this is really that local parentis. We're in place of parents when they're not with us. When they're with us, they're, we are... We are supposed to be taking their parents place and that also means you know the social aspect right and making sure that it's okay to have conflict but we absolutely have to allow them and nurture reconciliation how do we make things better so final question what message do you want your kids to take away at the end of the day when they leave you it's june or just the end of the day what do you want them to walk away with I'll go first because I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) I want my kids to leave with the only message, be kind. Mm. If you can be kind in life, that's all the rest will fall into place. It's, 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 It's funny because I have, I'll add to that, be kind and wonder, both Mm -hmm. with the O and the A, Mm -hmm. just be kind and wonder. And um, (laughs) I'll just jump in. In addition to be kind and wonder, yeah, because we want them to be lifelong learners, just, you know, uh, appreciate everyone around you and just try and treat others with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And I just thank them for being part of our community and making our year so special and try and leave them with a sense of, you know, you're you're an important person who played a really valuable part in this classroom community. And it's been so great that you've been here and, you know, all the best in your next community. I think for me, it would would be all these things that you folks have mentioned. And then in your learning, be enthusiastic. I remember hearing a talk on, it comes from the Greek for literally, the Greeks defined it as being on, in, and then theos, being in God. Mm -hmm. So not, uh, not saying be religious about your learning, but the idea of being so immersed in something that's so vast and huge and wondrous and just jump right in Mm -hmm. and like, Drink lots of water, gulp, <laughs> dr- <laughs> dr- drown, drown a little bit, yeah. and then learn learn your backstroke, and then you might laugh a little bit along the way, right? Mm-hmm. And then that this swim this process of swimming in the deep end is best done with your fellow swimmers. Love that, I love it. That's that a, a great beautiful t-shirt. yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go to our merch store. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I like it. SD Forty talks. Merch I often store. it's funny because uh, one of the uh, I share a TED talk with all my students. It's called the Empathic Civilization, mm. and it's about uh, Jeremy Rifkin. Oh, yeah. and Jeremy Rifkin goes over in, in his book and the TED talk how uh, we are actually hardwired for compassion. We're hardwired for generosity. We, mm. we physically have the cells in our brains. Uh, and again, it's called the empathic civilization. And so I share this talk with them, and he talks about how we are innately, our survival as a species exists, or we exist because of our compassion for each other. And as communication and technology evolved, we've been able to expand our empathy to the rest of the world. And so charitable organizations giving money to people we've never met in a country we'll never be to is an example of what he says is the expansion of our empathy. And so we're hardwired for it. And so that I think if I want to add to everything here we're saying is, is I, I often have my students, I say, go out and, and, and demonstrate empathy. You know, don't let somebody crush your innate mm-hmm. empathic connections to each other mm. and nature and the animals. And so I think that's something we often talk about. That's beautiful. I was just thinking that's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's a beautiful way to end. <laughs> Well, friends, back to the whole, our whole goal of the mentorship program is to never let anyone feel alone in this work. And, and just listening to this conversation today, this is very much what we are doing with our students. We want our students to feel that they are part of a community 
where they don't feel alone and, and you can be around multiple people throughout the day and still feel lonely you know and I think as teachers we're very aware of that you know I mean this job can be lonely too sometimes and so you know I think we're very I think that's on our radar all the time and you know so it's you know it's no surprise that we are done our schooling and we are now teaching and we are in our careers and we are working with kids and and yet here we are part of a mentorship program that has the same motto that we are also trying to instill in our students is that we don't want them to feel like they have to do this world alone. The world is going to be very unkind to, to our kids and, and to us, and we can be that safe place for our kids to land. And, and I believe just from this conversation today, this is evidence of, of the work that we're doing and that we, too, are helping them to not feel alone on their journey through, through, through learning. My friends, thank you so much. Colleen, Darren, Stephanie, and Richard, you are incredible humans, and I hope one day my kids get to be taught by you. Thank you so much for the work that you do, and I appreciate you being part of this. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.